and I'll wait uh, a sign two minutes before the presentation ends. Uh -huh. Every presentation is going to be recorded and it's going to be available on this web page. You go to this page and then you click uh, the link to YouTube. Um, two presenters already opted out of this, but if some somebody initially wants to opt out, uh, signal to the cameraman over there. Okay. And uh, with this in mind, I would uh, invite the first presenter, Alex Papic. Microphones on the camera. Okay. Let's go there. Let me go in. Pointer any. So hello everyone, my name is Alesh and uh, today I'm going to present to you uh, the paper with the title Risk Stratification of Cardiac uh, patients by utilizing additional unla unlabeled examples. Uh, the work was done for my master thesis and uh, my supervisor was Professor Zoran Bosnich. Uh, cardiovascular diseases are the leading cause of, uh, of morbidity and death worldwide together with uh, cancer and uh, respiratory diseases. Uh, to prevent them uh, patients need uh, early identification and medical guidance uh, understanding patients' uh, risk helps physicians to construct a, a preventive care plan which either um, reduces the risk for the development of the disease or prolongs the development of the disease. Uh, one of the methods used today for risk certification is called systematic coronary risk evaluation which uh, classifies patients in, in um, in uh, different levels for having a cardiac, uh, serious cardiac event um, and it's also found in the European guidelines. In our work we tackled the development of the patient risk stratification model and in order to improve the predictive performance we utilized additional unlabeled examples. Uh, we tested different, uh, different strategies that utilize the ideas of semi-supervised learning uh, and uh, we named them uh, semi-supervised learning, active learning, fuzzy learning and uh, uh, supervised clustering. Uh, the first method uh, comes from the uh, field of supervised learning and is called it, uh, in the literature self-learning. Uh, it takes two data sets uh, la with labeled and unlabeled examples what it does first, it trains a model on labeled data, which is then used to label unlabeled data and then combine both data sets to, to generate the, the final model. Um, in this case, uh, examples are labeled only once and we don't have any uh, selection criteria. We use all, all, all of the unlabeled examples. Uh, this method was used as a baseline for our experiments and uh, uh, for the ideas for the improvement. Um, in active learning approach, we focused on how to select, uh, how to select uh, unlabeled examples. And the main goal is to select such <coughs> examples that are going to uh, improve predictive performance. Uh, we desire uh, such, such examples which are labeled the most reliably. So we used uh, two metrics to evaluate the reliability of, uh, of, uh, pr of uh, labels. Uh, first is called posterior class probability, uh, which we get uh, by training the model and then, um, and then predicting the, the, the classes. 
And uh, the second one is called local modeling of the prediction error, uh, which is abbreviated as CNK. And what it does, it measures the, the average, uh, the average pos posterior probability for the queries uh, examples class in its local neighborhood. We take only uh, examples that are closest to, to, to the observed unlabeled example. Uh, in the third approach, which we named fuzzy learning, we focus on how to label, how to label uh, unlabeled examples. Uh, we label them with uh, weighted class probabilities. Um, so we observe each class separately and uh, weight the probabilities of the nearest neighbors for every class, uh, which we then sum up uh, uh, together. Uh, at the end, all of the fuzz so-called fuzzy probabilities are calibrated or, or normalized to sum up to one, so we ensure the probabilistic interpretation. Uh, we also implemented two selection criteria, same as in active learning, we use posterior class probability and uh, local modeling of prediction error. In the fourth approach, we focused on summarization of the, of the labeled examples. We used representative-based supervised clustering. Uh, the supervised clustering, what, uh, what it does, it's, it selects uh, a subset of examples for which it thinks that are representative for the problem. And um, we use those representatives to, to label unlabeled examples. Uh, for f to find uh, such representatives, we use the, the algorithm called uh, SRIDHCR, um, and labeling was done using the nearest, nearest neighbor approach. Uh, in this case, we didn't, uh, we didn't apply any selection criteria, but that's purely the case because uh, this algorithm is, has a high, high uh, time complexity. Evaluation, evaluation was done in the UCI heart disease database, specifically Cleveland, uh, Cleveland database. We used 297 uh, patients described with 14 attributes that were either classified as low risk or high risk uh, patients. And for the evaluation metric, we use area under the rock curve. Uh, what we did first was uh, randomize the data and then use uh, five-fold cross-validation to split data set in train and test set. Because our data doesn't contain unlabeled examples, we then divided train set into labeled and unlabeled set by simply hiding the, the classes, uh, classes for some examples. Uh, then labeled examples and uh, finally we evaluated the transductive performance, so the accuracy of labeling and inductive performance uh, for every model on independent uh, test set. Results. Um, first thing that we noticed was that fuzzy learning with uh, CNK selection method obtained the highest, uh, the, I the highest AUC for different percentages of, of, of labeled data. Uh, we used for learning algorithms, decision tree, KNN, Neve Bayesian classifier, and, uh, and SVM. Um, the next thing that we found out was that active learning with SVM, SVM showed the low average performance because SVM, uh, for some reason, in, uh, learned to uh, predict, in a few cases, the, the opposite classes. Uh, and the lowest the lowest transductive performance was obtained by supervised clustering. Um, yeah. uh, in the inductive performance evaluation, the first thing that we notice is that the AUC for all learning algorithms and combinations with, uh, with labeling methods uh, decreased for about 0 0.05. Uh, still, they, they resemble the results from transduct transductive evaluation. 
uh, we notice that again fu uh, fuzzy learning with CNK selection uh, method was uh, was the obtained the highest uh, AOC and uh, the, bi the biggest uh, difference in performance we noticed for supervised clustering even though that there were many misclassified examples in the in the introduced into the learning data set um, the final performances are pretty similar to 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 models used uh, which use different labeling uh, labeling methods uh, when we when we had 80% or more labeled examples <laughs> we noticed that the that the AOC uh, became similar for for all uh, for all approaches to conclude uh, to conclude these presentations uh, results our results are comparable to the results in the literature uh, the utilization of additional unlabeled examples shows promising results, uh, especially for fuzzy learning with CNK selection uh, method. Uh, for the future work, what we want is to evalu evaluate our approaches uh, using data with more complex risk levels. Here we, ca here we had a binary classification problem. Uh, score for example uses uh, four uh, four classes um, and next we want to analyze how supervised learning algorithms and input parameters affect the performance of uh, of labeling and then uh, the the final results of the the final performance of the of the trained model and also neural networks and deep learning are opening uh, opportunities also in medical area uh, but we didn't include them in this presentation due to the uh, due to the problems with with our resources we had limited resources but that's on the plan for for the future work um, thank you that's all from my side I'm ready to take questions so, any questions What were the features in this data set? Uh, the features in data, this data set were, uh, so it was the age, the gender, then we had some lab results like uh, cholesterol levels, we had uh, vital signs like uh, blood pressure. Um, those were the, the, the main uh, attributes in the, in the data set. Another question, I think you were always comparing your method against the first same supervised method but what happens if you don't use any unlabeled uh, instances at all if you only use the labeled, labeled ones uh, we try that at the end uh -huh. um, so yeah it, here in the transductive evaluation we always compared uh, our methods to the semi-supervised uh, learning method um, but then in the in the inductive performance we compared to the base model base model was mm -hmm. model trained only on the labeled examples initially and um, at the end we we did another experiment with uh, all the labeled examples and cnk uh, no fuzzy learning with cnk selection method came pretty close to the uh, to the base model learned on on all examples uh, Thank you. And I'll divide the next presenter, Jakob Vladic.
Uh, hello, my name is uh, Jakob Valic. I'm here employed at the Institute of Josef Stefan. Um, hello, everybody, and especially Borut and Mitya. Mitya is uh, the mentor of this uh, work. Uh, I'm going to present you our work on predictive modeling of feeling of health for congestive heart failure patients. So congestive heart failure is a serious disease. It affects 1 to 2 percent of the Western, um, this modern civilization. And uh, at the age of 70 years and more, it affects uh, up to 10 percent of the population. This disease cannot be cured, uh, although uh, some measure measurements can be, can be taken to improve the patient's quality of life and, of course, uh, maybe also to prolong it. Uh, we formally participated in Huron project, which, um, which uh, focused on predicting, uh, predicting modeling of uh, chronic uh, congestive heart failure uh, patients' hospi hospitalizations. Uh, but now, in, in this research, we used data from the Hartman project, so uh, there is this uh, smart, uh, smart watch and smartphone application. Uh, and this is this main uh, panel of the application, uh, which consists of these uh, mm, traditional approaches uh, to, uh, to uh, this heart failure patient's uh, management. It's by uh, assigning physical ac activities then by giving some nutritional advices and questionnaires, uh, monitoring peeling and other medication intake, and also mental, mental support, some games for relaxing. And uh, uh, so we used the data ac acquired from the, this Hartman watch, and also the self-reported patient's feeling of health. The, this will, uh, feeling of health was our main uh, research topic. To, so to make predictive modeling on how the patients felt based on the data uh, we obtained from the wearable devices and from the patient's uh, import, uh, input. Because the feeling of health is uh, subjective and patients uh, know themselves whether they feel good or bad. So we uh, made two clinical trials, first in Belgium and second in Italian. In, uh, this, uh, this was the last uh, year. And uh, the participating uh, patients were 36 in Belgium and 30 in Italian uh, patients. 80% of them were male. The average age was 63. And they were classified with New York Heart Association class 2 and 3, meaning they had slightly and they had limited uh, f uh, physical activities. Um, the trials lasted from three months to six months. Uh, these were the parameters that we gathered. Uh, with uh, Using this uh, Hartman watch, we uh, gathered uh, this, uh, these three parameters. The heart rate was obtained via PPG signal. Uh, then exercise parameters were um, were um, mm, were uh, mm, were made by uh, this uh, Hartman application, and this intensity was input by the patients themselves. Patients, besides uh, input their blood pressure, they had to measure every day their weight and the feeling of health once per day. Uh, also, we included the environmental um, uh, parameters such as air temperature, humidity. And, um, and yes, and something else with uh, uh, this Ruby tax station, a little box which measures uh, this. So this is our basis. As a basis, we, uh, as uh, uh, one instance for uh, predictive modeling, we took daily feeling of health input by patients. And we can see some patients uh, 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 some patients did the 60 uh, inputs of feeling of health, so they 60 days they, uh, they, they, they did this. One patient was really, uh, he almost did uh, 100, but some barely did. Why? Because 
ev uh, because every time they played these uh, mental exercises or games for relaxation, they were asked this question once per day. If they did not play, they could not answer this uh, question. They, they had to choose among uh, good feeling, bad feeling and usual feeling. Uh, then later on uh, we choose to, to, uh, to put it into one class, good feeling, bad feeling and the neutral class. And even later on we removed the neutral class to obtain better results. So we had to set, unfortunately we, um, we were faced with a lot of missing values uh, due to the technical problems in trials. So we had to set the threshold for the missing values. The best threshold was to uh, select only features with less than 318 uh, missing values. So this means the stricter the thresholds, the less features um, fit to that uh, threshold. But uh, still, we, we had to have, uh, uh, we wanted to have more features than just, just a few. And uh, also, this means uh, fewer features, then more instances without, without uh, more instances without uh, missing values, uh, because we only took the, the instances without missing values. And for some, we did the imputa imputation with uh, k nearest neighbors method. This assigns um, um, an average value of. Uh, Wait, yeah, uh, this method sets each missing value to the mean value of the same feature of k most similar instances. So we don't have it here. We look at the similar instances, uh, uh, features elsewhere, and we do the we, we we do the mean value of this missing. This proved to be uh, effective up to thirty days of uh, imputation. After that, it, it proved uh, contraproductive. We used uh, two machine learning algorithms, scikit-learn uh, um, uh, to make a decision tree human readable, we will see later, and extreme gradient boosting. Um, it uh, it uh, output better results, but uh, for the price uh, of understandability. So, uh, and about two and three classes I already told, and here are the results. The best results are for two classes. With three classes we sometimes got even uh, worse results than the majority. This decision tree is secret learn and this is extreme gradient boosting. So we focused on 30 features and this extreme gradient boosting gave us the best results. In Belgian data, the percentage rises up to 76% because in Italian trial we had more technical problems. Now let's take a look at some decision tree. The, these values denote the first value is uh, how many patients felt good and how many patients felt bad in regarding to the condition stated above. And the graphical representation is if something is uh, more orange, they felt, uh, the more patients felt uh, good if uh, the condition is true. And if, if the condition is uh, false and uh, the, the more blue, the, the, the bad, more bad the patients felt. So let's take a look at uh, the main criteria turned out to be systolic blood pressure and it, it, it says if the systolic blood pressure is high the patients generally felt good because heart uh, congestive heart failure patients have problems with their heart output so if their um, systolic blood pressure is low they generally feel bad although here we have one group that felt good um, even uh, even with this con condition that yes and why because their standard uh, deviation of heart rate was high so their heart was able to adapt to more changes during the day 
And in this group, we have one, one, uh, one subgroup that felt bad because their heart average was, I it was, uh, their heart average was, yeah, mm, their, th their heart average was, um, heart rate average was high. So, um, mm, it is in line with uh, this medical knowledge. Uh, we did some indi individualization as well. So, uh, we took one patient out and just trained the models on other patients' data. And uh, extreme gradient boosting gives us better results than majority without adding this person's, uh, uh, any of this person's uh, data. But when we add 10% of uh, uh, this patient's data, the, the accuracy improves and by 20% the accuracy is uh, better still. This is uh, a step towards the personalization of, uh, of models, predictive models. So, as we saw, this, our um, findings are in line with existing medical knowledge. <coughs> we were surprised because the ambiental, ambient data did not prove to be that important. In Kiron project, it, imp it, it was really important. Uh, May I uh, just, uh, if uh, the humidity was high, the patients uh, usually felt uh, bad? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yes, uh, and here it was not so important. Maybe the, the difference is in Kiron project, the patients uh, had to compare their feeling of health compared to the previous day. Here it was just the general question about the feeling uh, of day in in, in a given day. So this is uh, a basis for further investigation and it can help uh, personal decision support systems. So uh, thank you for your attention. Yes. So, in general, if someone has more than 92 systolic blood pressure, he feels good and he said he has high systolic blood pressure. Is it in general for these people that they have lower blood pressure overall because 92 is quite low for systolic, it seems to me? It's heart failure. Yeah, I, I guess that people with heart failure often have very low blood pressure and this is a problem for them and that's I mean, it's, it's not that more than 90 is good, but okay. it, it's rather that less than 90 is a problem. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? If I remember correctly, we did try with personalized data, or at, at the very least, we did it on the previous Kiron data. I, I, I'm not sure for this one. Uh, and I think it didn't help, surprising as, as it is, because usually that kind of personalization helps. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you for the presentation. Mm.
Okay, so hello everyone. I'm Martin and this work is done together with uh, Dr. Anton Gradishek, Borut Budna, they're in the, uh, uh, somewhere here, and also Dr. Gero Polgayan from the University of Medical Center in Ljubljana, whereas we are at the Jose Stefan Institute at the Department of Intelligence Systems. So uh, I'm, we are going, I'm going to continue to something that Jakob was presenting, but in this case, I'm going to talk about another disease which is different from the previous one. So this is about uh, chronic heart failure. And in this work, we did some analysis of features that might be informative and uh, for building pre predictive models for detecting different heart fail chronic heart failure stages. Now, chronic heart failure uh, is, a, is a disease where the heart is not, not able to pump enough blood and it affects 6 to 10 percent of the of the of people that are <coughs> older than 65 years. Uh, I believe this number is f about uh, Slovenia that the they have diagnosis and treatment uses around uh, 2 percent of the annual health healthcare budget whereas uh, for the USA for example only in 2018 they've spent 35 billion dollars uh, for such uh, this, uh, for treating these patients and is expected to double in, in 10 years. So uh, this disease is not curable, but uh, it can be kept uh, in check with medication and also heartless uh, transplants in uh, worst case scenarios. So what we want uh, to do is with this work is basically to minimize the, 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 the medic, the um, to minimize the cost of, of, this, of this disease. So how uh, say, uh, chronic heart failure is usually diagnosed? So in, in the hospitals they use some kind of uh, biomarkers, for example that is one biomarker pro-BMP, which is uh, informative for predicting cardiac events and also they use ultrasound, x-ray and uh, the whole uh, medical information history of the patient, whereas uh, regarding sensors, uh, it can be detected using ECG data. And in our case, uh, we focused on PCG, PCG data, which is uh, data acquired using phonocardiography, which is basically is uh, uh, audio digital stethoscope, which pro provides audio signal. So this is comparison between ECG and PCG data. So on the upper graph, we have uh, the ECG signal and the, uh, the known QRS complex. So basically, the RR interval, the R peaks represent uh, the, the, the timings where the heart uh, is pumping, uh, is uh, doing the, the contraction. And this is PCG data, so this is how the, the corresponding, uh, the sound of the heart corresponds to the ECG data. So uh, for the RR intervals, we have uh, something called S1 sounds, which is mitral valve closure, where then there is the S2 sound, which is aortic valve closure. And what is typical for uh, CKF patients is that they have another third sound, S3. So this is basically the what motivated us to use audio PCG data. However, this signal is very hard to detect, especially in noise environments such as hospitals. And when you ask the doctors uh, to record you some PCG data, usually there are some nurses around talking uh, near the patient. So uh, this S3 sound is quite uh, hard to detect. So that's why we continued with some <coughs> more advanced machine learning uh, methods. In our previous work, uh, we focused on first, so the, 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 the simpler task was whether we can detect chronic heart failure patients. So we have recording from healthy people and recording for, uh, f recordings from uh, chronic heart failure patients. And we built some complicated machine learning scheme. This is basically a stack of uh, several classifiers that can detect whether the recording belongs to a, a healthy or an unhealthy, <coughs> unhealthy person, unhealthy being uh, chronic heart failure patients. Uh, and this detects chronic heart failure patients with accuracy around uh, between 87 and 90 percent. 
Uh, then we also did some additional work recently uh, where we combined classical machine learning and uh, deep learning models which are, are capable of learning directly from the sound data, from the PCG data. Uh, and in this work we extensively tested the methodology for uh, detecting uh, different um, heart failure uh, patients, so not only cr uh, chronic heart failure but also we used some uh, other available data sets uh, for with PCG data and it turned out that the methodology is quite robust. Uh, so with this work we can detect whether one uh, re PCG recording is healthy or unhealthy but what next because that is not uh, <coughs> big much of use of for the doctors. So in this case uh, once we know that some one a person is uh, has the uh, chronic heart is diagnosed with the half. Uh, once there, they feel bad, so that is in the decompensated phase where uh, I believe uh, there is a lot of fluids in, in their uh, heart or lungs. I'm not sure what are uh, at the actual problems of this patient, but this stage is called decompensated uh, stage, decompensation phase. In this case, they need to go to the hospital to get uh, to receive medical treatments, and they usually uh, spend a few uh, days in the hospital. Uh, and after those few days, uh, they're in so-called co uh, co compensated phase or recompensated. So uh, that's when they feel good and they can, that, that uh, uh, feeling of good, so that compensated uh, phase lasts for a few weeks. And then uh, they uh, go have to again have to go to the hospital. So our idea here is, okay, uh, whether we can distinguish between these two uh, stages. Uh, using some uh, mobile sensing technologies and maybe we can uh, prevent the hospitalization phase or at least minimize uh, the, the bad, uh, minimize the time sp spent at the hospital. Uh, so in in for this analysis we have data from 22 patients and we have uh, two recordings per patient. One recording is from the decompensated phase so the bad phase and one is recording from the recompensated phase and the data is gathered using digital stethoscope which give, give us the audio data or also called PCG data, uh, data from phonocardiography. The recordings that we have are 30 seconds and each of these recordings, uh, this is the methodology that we used. So we have the two recordings, the green one is uh, from the recompensation, the Red one is from the recompensation phase. Each of these recordings is, uh, is segmented using sliding window. So we tried different sliding windows and now we present the results. So we tried from one second, that is we want to have at least one heartbeat in, in the window and up to 10 seconds, that, that amounts to 10 to 15 heartbeats in the, in the window. Uh, and we use some uh, Statistical features, so basically mean, standard deviation and so on, energy features, frequency based features, but also some uh, audio based features, features that are usually uh, used in uh, problems such as uh, voice recognition, emotion recognition and so on, but uh, these features basically describe the, the audio uh, information encoded in the, in the, in the signal. And what we did, uh, we use uh, Wilco Wilcoxon statistical test in order to compare for each feature uh, whether, whether we can distinguish between the, uh, the decompensated segments and the recompensated segments. Now we discussed a lot with uh, the, the reviewers whether Wilcoxon statistical test is, uh, can be used in this case. And the reason why we use uh, Wilkerson statistical test is because it provides person-specific and pairwise comparison between the, the, the two instances that you compare, whereas other feature ranking methods such as mutual information and so on, they don't uh, take into account that the instances are actually related between themselves. So that's why we went with the Wilkerson statistical test. Uh, these are some results. So here uh, we present the number of features that had uh, p-value lower than 0 0.001. Uh, I'm not claiming that these results are statistically significant because there were a lot of features and the dataset is small, 
but ju we use ju this threshold to see how uh, just to rank the features. And for example, for a window size of two seconds, we have uh, at least 16 features that seem informative. And here is a visual representation of some of those features. So each of these box plots represent uh, one feature. The blue color represents uh, the distribution of the decomposite, the recordings, which are marked as de recorded in decomposition phase, and the orange represents the, rec uh, the feature values for the recordings that are in recomposition uh, recomposition phase. So there is uh, obviously a difference in the in the distributions of these features, and the lines between the the blue box plus and the orange box plus uh, represent. Uh, the two recordings that are from the same person. So, for example, the top one recording, the feature value from the person uh, that had uh, that was in the decompensated phase at the very beginning was 32.5, whatever that feature is, and then after the rec and the, the treatment, that value decreased too. So, so if it's, uh, the red lines represent uh, the feature values for which represent people for which uh, this uh, di the difference between the, the decomposition value and the recomposition value were not lower as expected with the majority of the other people. So basically this means, so these are, for each feature we have only two people for which uh, the, <coughs> the decomp decomposition value was lower than the de uh, recomposition value which means that if we were to build some uh, simple decision tree based on only one of these features, we would miss only two out of uh, 22 people, which is around 90% accuracy if we, would, we were to detecting these uh, uh, chronic heart failure st uh, stages using those features. So this is the conclusion and the, the, the future work. Uh, we analyzed around 4,000 features for the for distinguishing these two phases. Turns out that shorter windows are a bit more informative compared to longer windows uh, for the feature extraction. And we discovered at least four features for which the value of the decompensated uh, phase is lower than the compensated phase. And in future, we are running another uh, one more study in which so uh, we are gathering more uh, data to reevaluate the results. And also, we want to provide a, a better granularity between these two stages, so not to wait until the decompensated phase where the patient needs the treatment. So thank you for the attention, and I'm ready to take some questions. <laughs> yeah. uh, <coughs> what you were doing is some kind of feature selection. Yeah. Uh, did you try to do this uh, in some kind of cross-validation scheme? Because that would kind of answer the question whether these features really are meaningful or is this just by chance because you have so many of them? So cross-validation, what we have tried is leave one subject out cross-validation, mm -hmm. uh, but not for the feature selection part, it was for uh, building decision tree predictive model whether the person is recompensated or decompensated. And the numbers are similar. We are around 93% accuracy, I think. So it, it are even better because some of those, the decision tree combines some of those features. It's a bit better. But when you did this, did you do some kind of feature selection first or did you do it with all the features? Uh, it, it really doesn't matter. Uh -huh. okay. the, yeah, the decision tree find the informative features and also I've tried building uh, decision tree with only these four features and all 4,000 features but I always end up with a uh, small decision tree which is quite good in, in predicting so those. This does suggest that there are meaningful features in there, yeah? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you for the presentation. Thank you.
So, hello. I will present fintech based student clustering 